this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. A couple years ago, Anthony Newley sang, What kind of a fool am I? to the top of the charts. And uh, I looked up in the dictionary to see what a fool is, or one of my associates did for me. And the Bible has a lot to say about fools and what a fool is. Proverbs 10, 21, it says, Fools die for the want of wisdom. Proverbs 1, 7 says, Fools despise wisdom. Uh, when P.T. Barnum came to this country many years ago, he said, The American people want to be fooled, and I'm here to fool them. He said, A fool is born every minute. And uh, now synonyms that you can find for the word fool is stupid person, bonehead, blockhead, simpleton, chump, nitwit, goose, sap, numbskull, ignoramus, beetlehead, whatever you want. <laughs> a one who has been imposed on by others, a stooge, a gullible, or a dupe. Now in the Bible, it may mean all of this, but it also has a moral meaning in the Bible and is a very important word in the Bible. And the verses seem almost paradoxical. 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, Let him become a fool. And Proverbs 1.7 says, Fools despise wisdom. And God is speaking from the divine standpoint. In one passage, the fool is an unthinking, thoughtless, careless person without true understanding. In the other passage, the word fool is used from the standpoint of people who have received Christ because the world laughs at them and says they're foolish and ridiculous. They're fools. So there are unwise fools and they're wise fools. Now Jesus said, whoever calls his brother a fool is in danger of hellfire. You be very careful how you call another person a fool. I wouldn't dare use that name for you or for anybody else. Never use the word fool in anger, the Bible says. But I'm telling you what God says about it in certain instances. First, there's the atheistic fool. It's repeated twice in Psalm 53, 1 and Psalm 14, 1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. But in Hebrew, it actually means there is no God for me. In other words, the this fool deliberately says, there is no God for me. He's not saying there's no God. He's saying there's no God for me. Then there's the practical atheist. You see, there are many people that are really not atheists, but they are practical atheists in the sense that they live like an atheist. You profess to believe in God, but you don't live like you believe in God. You live as though there is no God. You too, in a sense, are an atheist. And there are hundreds here tonight like that. You believe in God with your mind. You may go to church, but you live as though God does not exist as far as you are concerned. And so you are an atheist in a sense. And then secondly, the Bible talks about the mocking fool, the mocking fool. Fools make a mock of sin, Proverbs 14, 9. Here is God in all of his holiness. And the Bible tells us that we've sinned against him. We've broken his laws, and we're under the sentence of death. We're under the sentence of death. I saw a film tonight on television on one of the news programs telling how many men and women are on death row in the United States right now. Under the sentence of death. All of us here tonight are under the sentence of death. The wages of sin is death, and we have all sinned and broken the laws of God. And so we're all sentenced to die. We are to die physically. The graveyards are full of, full of people that are there because sin caused death. And then sin also causes spiritual death. Your soul is dead. Your spirit is dead. Physically you're alive, but your soul that lives inside your body is dead toward God. So you're a walking dead person under the sentence of death. And the only way that you can have that sentence lifted is to come to Christ by repentance of sin and faith in Him as your Lord and your Savior. If you would like that sentence lifted, if you would like your sins wiped out as though they had never existed, if you would like to be justified in the sight of God, pick up that telephone right now, you that are watching by television. Pick it up and call the number that you see on your screen and a counselor will answer 
and the counselor will talk to you about how you can come to know Christ. As many people here tonight, I hope and believe and pray, will find Christ as their Lord and Savior. But there are many people that make a mockery of sins. They mock God's standards, God's standards of sex, God's standards of marriage, God's standards concerning divorce and ethics and morality and social justice. We make a mockery of it. We laugh at it. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. Don't ever doubt it. Your sin, your sin will find you out, though no one on earth may discover it. You may never be caught. You may never have to pay for it here, as far as you can tell. But your sin will someday be found out. No one ever commits one sin that isn't found out. Everything that you did in the darkness, every evil thought that you ever had is going to be found out because it'll all be recorded. It's being recorded awaiting the judgment day. It's being recorded on tape machines far more sophisticated than anything we have. It's being recorded. Even your thoughts and your sins will find you out and it'll be exposed to the whole universe. Will find you out. Will. It's only a question of time. The word will is definite. Will find you out. Find. Perhaps you've deceived everyone else, your wife, your family, your church, your friends, but the Bible says your sin will definitely find you out. A detective at last after running away so long and hiding so long, God's hand will come on your shoulder and say, I have found you. You've been found out. We now know. And then thirdly, there's the slandering fool, the slandering fool. He that hideth hatred with lying lips and he that uttereth a slander is a fool, passing along an evil story about others maligning other people's character, wrecking their reputations by evil gossip. Gossiping is listed in the Bible as one of the worst of all sins. And yet how frequent that's done even in circles that call themselves Christians. It's a terrible sin in the sight of God and God says that person is a fool. You wouldn't think of killing a person with a gun or a knife. But then many times we assassinate a character or try to pull someone down or to get even or because of jealousy by whispering innuendos. Someone told me or he did thus and so. We commit murder by character assassination. Worse than killing a man with a pistol, a knife or a club. He that others a slander, the scripture says, is a fool. And then fourthly, there's the Christian fool. The Christian fool. Remember the road to Emmaus after Jesus Christ had died on the cross for our sins and he'd been raised again? And remember he was appearing to the disciples, in fact, 11 different appearances after his resurrection. And this is one of them. And these two disciples were on the way to Emmaus outside of Jerusalem. They were sad. They were disappointed. They were disillusioned. And they were mumbling and groaning among themselves. And another man joined them. And they didn't recognize who he was. And he talked to them, said, why are you so downcast? They said, oh, we thought he was to be the Messiah. Haven't you heard all the happenings in Jerusalem during the past week about this Jesus who did wonderful things? We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he'd come to save the world, but he didn't. He disappointed us. They killed him on a cross and now the third day is passing. We heard rumors that he might be raised from the dead, but we don't accept that. And then Jesus said, oh, fools, you're fools. Then he started expounding to them the scriptures from Moses through the prophets as to who he really was. And then he went to spend the evening with them and he was sitting at the meal in their home in Emmaus. And all of a sudden their eyes were open and they saw it was Jesus. In other words, the Christian fool who has the Word of God in his hand, who reads his testimony and yet doubts the promises of God. Jesus said, oh, you fools, 
for not believing the scriptures that he was going to rise from the dead and someday he's coming back. And then, fifthly, there's the covetous food. And the story is told in Luke, the 12th chapter. Jesus told the story about a rich man in his barns. You remember he built his barns and he said he was going to retire because he'd made enough money now, probably going to go to Southern California, Florida, come here to Idaho to this beautiful place and retire. He'd made enough money. And he said, soul, take thine ease. Drink and be merry. And that night he had a heart attack and when he was dying, there was a voice heard from heaven that said, Thou fool, this night thy soul is required of thee. And the scripture says, Jesus said, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, he tried to find happiness in the wrong place, money. He ignored the power of influence in that no man liveth unto himself. He must have had a family. He disregarded death. He had made no provision for eternity. He had provision for his retirement. How many men and women I know who have planned for retirement, planned everything, but they haven't prepared to die and they die shortly after they retire? It's amazing. I've thought about that. Some people announce their retirement. You read two or three weeks later that they dropped dead of a heart attack. They thought they were going to have five or 10 or 15 or 20 years that they could just take it easy and enjoy life. But it doesn't always work out that way. You better be sure that you have prepared to meet God. Every person who is more concerned about getting some of this world's goods and leaving out the preparation for eternity is a fool. Or the person who spends their time in social climbing or having pleasure more than eternal things is a fool in the sight of God. If you're not concerned about your home in heaven, you're not concerned about the riches that will never fail, not concerned about laying up treasure where moth and rust doth not corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal, then you're a fool. If you'd ask this man, what is your name? Well, he'd say, my name's the rich man. Or I'm the prosperous man that you read about. Or I'm an eminent man. Or I'm a great man in the neighborhood. Or I'm a famous man. My name is in the paper all the time. Then ask God, Lord, what is this man's name? And the answer comes back, fool. He's a fool. That's his name. The rich man knew every name but the right one. He had been called by his family name, his given name, his ranks, his titles, his wealth the flatteries of men, but in the sight of God, his name was Thou Fool. That's all we know about him, that he was just a rich fool that laid up treasures on earth, but laid up nothing for heaven. And how many of us are in the same category? You may not be rich in the sense that this man was rich, but everybody in America is rich compared to Bangladesh and people that I've, where we've been in many places of the world, like in Africa or as Victor was talking about in, in Vietnam, where he was a missionary for some years. Very few of you would stir if I would look out on this audience and say, fool, come here, I'd like to see you. How many of you would get up and come? <laughs> Very few, maybe nobody. But the Bible says, how are they brought into desolation as in a moment? Quickly, it can all end. Your dream house comes tumbling down. Trouble in the family. The wealth is gone. Here was a man, a multimillionaire perhaps, but standing a hand's breadth away from his own grave. Counting on everything in this life, the happiness, the joy that this life could give him, and he's called in the Bible by Jesus a fool. And then seventhly, there's another kind of a fool, or sixthly, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. 1 Corinthians 1.18, but unto us which were saved, it is the power of God. What the world counts foolish, we have rested our eternal salvation on. 
And when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, turn your back on the pleasures and the sensual lust and things of this world, people think you're a fool. The world that does not know Christ looks foolish to me. Why can't they see? Why can't they understand? I want to grab everybody I see on the street and everybody we pass, everybody in the hotel, I want to grab them and say, look here, Christ could change your life. I see their empty faces and I, I see the ho hear the hollow laughter. And I see them drinking, trying to drink their, themselves into some happiness or taking the drugs in that hollow stare that they have. And I say, oh, if I could only just shake them loose. But you see, only the Holy Spirit can do that. I cannot do the work of the Holy Spirit for him. The Holy Spirit must convict them of sin. He must also lift this veil that's over their minds. And so salvation is of the Lord, the Bible says. If anyone desires wisdom, let him take his place in identification with Jesus Christ. What the world calls foolish, I'm resting my salvation on the cross of Christ, no matter what the world may think of him or of me. We're fools for Christ's sake, willing for the world to look at us as out of our minds, willing to be accounted as the very offscoring of the earth because we've turned to Christ. Are you one of the devil's fools? Are you willing to be a fool for Christ's sake? The Bible says in Proverbs 12, the way of a fool is right in his own eye. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Which road are you on? The narrow road that leads to eternal life or the broad road that leads to destruction? You have to make a choice. The scripture says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Are you going to continue to be a fool in the sight of God? Or are you going to become another kind of fool the Christ fool that the world will call a fool and call foolishness. Because you see, when you come to Christ, there's a price to pay. And one of the prices you pay is being misunderstood by some members of your family, some people in the community, some people where you work or where you go to school. And that's what Jesus meant when he said, come and take up the cross and follow me. You see, the cross that you bear, the cross that you bear is identification with Christ. It's not some special sickness that you get or some trouble you get. It's identifying with Christ and letting people laugh at you and being willing for them to make sport of you if necessary for following Christ. That's your cross. And if you're not willing to take that cross, you cannot be his follower, he said. Are you willing to take that cross? Are you willing to turn your life totally over to Christ? Some of us have got one foot in heaven and one foot in hell as it were one foot in the world one foot in the kingdom of god and we're straddling the fence god does not allow fence straddlers you cannot be a mugwomp that's what a mugwomp is a fence straddler god christ does not allow that he allows no neutrality you can't not be both you must come all out for him and you'll find that all the way through the bible you'll find it all the way through the teachings of jesus a great crowd was following jesus one day and he turned and talked to them about the fact that he was going to die on the cross and it said many followed him no more why because they couldn't take this talk of the cross do you want christ in your heart pick up that telephone right now if you're watching by television Talk to that counselor, make that call, and if, you, if it's a busy signal, call again. They'll be there all evening, all over the country. And you can talk to somebody and receive Christ into your heart tonight. Because you see, when Christ died on the cross, it says that the crowd down below, the mob below, ridiculed and laughed. And they said, what a fool. You saved others, but you cannot save yourself. <laughs> and Jesus was hanging there. And in heaven, 72,000 angels, 10 legions drew their swords, ready to come and rescue him. But he said, no, I love them. And when he died on the cross, he took your sins. 
Every sin that you've ever committed, he took on that cross. He took your death penalty for you. And because he was the son of God, and because he was sinless, he could bear your sins. And God has accepted his death as a sin offering for our sins. So that when God looks at me now, he doesn't see Billy Graham the sinner. I am a sinner. I have sinned, but I've placed my sins under the blood of Christ. And the blood that was shed on the cross washes my sins away symbolically in the sight of God so that when God looks at me, he cannot see my sins. And God has a unique ability that you don't have. God can forget. And it says that he forgets your sins. In other words, the tapes are erased from the time you were born till the time you die. Because if one sin ever remained on those tapes, you'd never make it to heaven. God is righteous and holy. And before you can get into heaven, you must be righteous too. And the only way you can get any righteousness is to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he offers you that righteous clothing tonight free. You don't have to pay for it. But you have to do three things. You must repent of your sins. That means you're willing to change your way of life. You're willing to change completely and put Christ first in your life from this moment on. You may be a member of the church. You may be a Catholic, a Mormon, Jewish, Protestant, whatever you are. You need Christ. And you want to make that commitment. I'm not asking you to join a church tonight, a specific church. I'm asking you to make sure that your sins are forgiven and that you're ready for heaven. First, repent. Second, receive him by faith into your heart. Faith means trust, total commitment. It means that he becomes the pilot of your plane or he becomes the driver of your car, of your life. You turn all the decision-making over to him. And that's a wonderful thing. You trust him for your salvation. And then the third thing, you're willing to obey him. Study the scriptures and pray and obey him and do what he says and be his follower no matter what the cost. I'm going to ask you to make that commitment tonight. I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen hundreds of people at each service do so far. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say by coming, I want to make that commitment. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to know the sentence of death has been lifted. I want to know I'm going to heaven. Why do I ask you to come forward publicly? Because Jesus said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. Jesus said, now is the, or the scripture says, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise that there'll ever be a tomorrow for you. It's tonight. I believe there are hundreds of people here tonight that may never have this moment again in your whole life in which you're so close to the kingdom of God. Just get up and come. Fathers, mothers, young people, hundreds of you. You want Christ in your heart tonight. You want to make that commitment. You get up and come. Quickly. And as people are coming forward here at the Coliseum, you make that telephone call right now. The number is on your screen, and counselors are standing by ready to help you. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You that are watching by television can see that here in Boise, Idaho, many people are coming to make this commitment to Christ tonight. You can make that commitment right now where you are. You may be in a bar room. You may be in a nightclub. You may be in a hotel room. You may be in your living room or in your bedroom. Just say yes to Christ and let him come into your heart. 
As you can see, men and women and boys and girls from all over the Colosseum have come forward tonight to commit their heart and life to Jesus Christ. This is also a time of decision for many of you. Until then, this is Cliff Barrow speaking for Billy Graham and every member of the team saying goodbye and may God richly bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. I want you to turn with me to a passage of Scripture that everybody knows. It's the easiest passage and the one that almost everyone has memorized in the New Testament, John 3.16. It was the first passage of scripture that I ever memorized as a boy. My mother taught it to me while she was giving me a bath once. And this is the passage, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want us all to say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Last year, the number one motion picture in the United States and I suppose throughout the world that drew the largest box office was a motion picture that was made just for a small amount of money. Nobody ever thought it would amount to much. It was based upon a simple little story and it was called Love Story. And then last year, the Duke of Windsor died and a headline in the British papers said the greatest love story of the century. But the greatest love story of all time is summed up in these 25 verses of 25 words that someone is called a miniature Bible, the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The greatest love story ever told for God. Do you ever stop and think about God? Many people are thinking about God today because we've seen that science does not have an answer to all of our problems. We are seeing that technology cannot solve all of our problems. And so thousands of young people in Europe and in America are beginning to talk about God. Some of them are going to India to see if they can find peace in their hearts. Some of them are going and studying yoga and they're going into all sorts of different sects and groups searching for God. Some of them are going out into the desert and sitting under the stars and watching the stars. Have you ever wondered about God? Someone asked me at a university one day, can you prove God exists? And I answered, no. I cannot put God in a test tube. I cannot put God in a laboratory and say, here's God. How do I know that God exists? All the evidence seems to indicate that he does. I look up in the starry sky and I say, there must be a God. 
I look at the beautiful nature round about me, and I say there must be a God. I see the birth of a baby. Gary Player was telling us yesterday how he saw the birth of his last child. And he said, as I watched that, I knew that there had to be a God. But there's another reason. Deep in your heart, you have a conscience. And your conscience tells you there must be a God. Something down inside tells me there must be a God. And the Bible tells us that this God is the creator of all the universe. In Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now in that passage in Genesis 1, there is no explanation. There's no attempt to prove God. It just says, in the beginning, God. Because everybody believes in God. Oh, but you say, I've met some atheists. You met some atheists that hadn't had any real trouble yet. But you find a person who claims he's an atheist and let someone announce to him that he has terminal cancer and you'll say, my God, help me. Or he get into a battle or get into a difficult spot, he'll say, my God, help me. I remember Mr. Khrushchev was touring the United States. And of course, being the head of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, he didn't believe in God. But one day he let slip several things. He quoted several passages of scripture, and he called them old Russian sayings. And then he said, may God have mercy upon you. Then he caught himself and he said, of course, I don't believe in God. But you see, down inside, something in Mr. Khrushchev was saying, you believe in God. Yes, all men know that there must be a God. He is the creator. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Now the Bible tells us God is a spirit. God doesn't have a body like yours. If God had a body like yours, he would have to be in one place at one time. But God doesn't have a body like yours. God is a spirit. And God can be in Africa. He can be in Asia. He can be in Europe. He can be in America all at the same time. He can be on a planet. He can be on the moon at the same time. I've talked to some of those astronauts that went to the moon. And they told me, that they knew as they went around the moon, there must be a God. I talked to some of the prisoners of war from Vietnam just a few days before I came on this trip. I talked to those first prisoners that came back to the United States and they told us in those prison cells for eight years in Vietnam, they knew there was a God. God is a spirit. The Bible tells us that God is unchanging. He never changes. Fashions change. Every part of our culture and life changes. And vast changes are underway throughout the world. And South Africa is finding that she can no longer live isolated from the rest of the world. Neither can we in America. And the great problems that we face are under tremendous pressure from world public opinion. The jet plane, modern communications have made it impossible. Fashions change, culture changes, technology changes. But God never changes. The Bible says, I am the Lord God, I change not. The Bible says, there is no variableness, no shadow of turning with God. God has not changed in thousands of years. 10,000 times 10,000 years from now, God will be the same. God is from everlasting to everlasting. God does not change. The Bible also tells us that God is a holy God absolutely holy the bible says thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil thou canst not look on iniquity god is holy and righteous and you'll never understand god you'll never understand about god and god's dealing with us until you understand that god is absolutely pure and god is absolutely holy and god cannot even look upon sin with any approval whatsoever and then the bible tells us that God is a God of judgment. In Ecclesiastes 12, 14, the Bible says, God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. There's a judgment day coming. You're going to be there if you're outside of Christ and every secret thing will be brought to light. Everything that you hid, everything that you did that you didn't think anybody knew about, all of your thoughts, all of your motives, all of your intents, 
all of your actions are on God's computers and God is keeping a record and someday you're going to have to stand before a holy God and give an account at the great judgment day. Jesus said, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof on the day of judgment. The apostle Paul said in his great sermon at Athens, he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that man, Christ Jesus. There's a day of judgment coming. He has appointed a day. It's all set. You're going to be there. And every secret thing that you've ever thought or done will be flashed on the scoreboards up in heaven at the judgment. And the whole world will see what you really were down inside. God is a God of judgment. But the Bible also teaches that God is a God of love. That God loves. I'm glad that's in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. That God is a God of love and mercy and grace. And that God loves everybody. I don't care who you are. He has the hairs of your head numbered. He sees the sparrow fall. He's interested in you. And he loves you. Now there are several Greek words that are translated love. Eros means sensual love, sexual love. Phileo means friendship love, the love that I would have for a friend. But when the writers of the New Testament were trying to find a word that would describe the love of God, they invented a new word, agape, the divine love, a love that we cannot know outside of God. There is no love that you can think of in human relationships comparable to the love that God has for you and that God has for me. God loves you. You say, but Billy, I don't deserve such love. I'm a sinner. I've broken God's law. I failed him a thousand times. I know that's the beauty and the greatness and the thrill of God's love that no matter what you've done, he loves you. For God so loved the world, the black world, the white world, the yellow world, the red world, the rich world, the poor world, the uneducated world, the educated world, and he loves us all the same. God loves you. And God loved us so much that he gave his son. Now, why did he have to give his son? What happened? What tragedy? What disaster came upon the human race? The Bible tells us that God created you, created man. He put him in paradise. He put him in utopia. And God gave to man a gift he did not give to his other creatures. God created us in his image. Not in the physical image of God, but in the spiritual image. We have a moral nature and we have the right to choose. And God said, I'm going to give you everything in the world for your happiness. But there's one tree over here that I don't want you to touch because I've given you the freedom of choice. I want you to choose me because you want to. I want you to love me and serve me because you want to serve me. You want to love me. I don't want you to do it because I make you. I've given you the tremendous responsibility of freedom of choice. So I put a tree here, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou shalt eat thereof, thou shalt die. What happened? Man looked at the tree. He looked at the fruit. He saw it was an unusual fruit. Probably had a magnificent taste. The devil was there in the form of a serpent to tempt him. And the Bible says that man broke the law of God Man rebelled against God. Man failed the test. And man made his own deliberate choice. God said, in the day that you eat it, in the day that you rebel against me, in the day that you break this law of the Garden of Eden, you shall die. God had to keep his word. Man had to die. Or God would not be holy. So from that moment on, 
man began to die. He died physically. He died spiritually. He died eternally. And all the troubles and all the problems of the world down through history have come from that great disaster because all of us are the sons of Adam. All of our prejudices, all of our hates, all of our fightings, all of our bickerings, all of our jealousies, all of our pride, everything that troubles the human race today came from the fact that we have rebelled against God and we're all guilty. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the Bible says. You have sinned. I have sinned. We are guilty. Pascal once said, in seeking to become angels, we have become less than men. Carl Jung, the great psychologist, once said, it is becoming more and more obvious that our problems are not social. He said it's not starvation, it's not cancer, but man himself who is mankind's greatest danger. Bertrand Russell once said, it is in our hearts that the evil lies. It's in our hearts. That's what Jesus taught, that our problems lie in our hearts because Jesus said, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, thefts, false witness, blasphemy. Jesus said, your problem is a heart problem. The Apostle Paul said, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. There's a mystery about it. None of us really knows exactly where the devil came from. I'm writing a book right now on the devil. I've been doing a lot of research for 18 months on the subject. We don't know for sure exactly how the devil came, but we know that he's a factor. We know that he is there, tempting and pulling and trying us and attacking us and harassing us at every turn. And we know that mankind made the fateful choice in Adam to follow the devil instead of God. But the Bible says in spite of our rebellion, in spite of our sins, God loves us. And God gave his only son. Now the Bible says the wages of sin, the result of sin is death. What kind of death? Well, you go out here and you see the cemeteries and you know that people die physically. Yes, we're all going to die. In a hundred years, every person in this audience will be dead. Perhaps in 50 years, we'll all be dead. Everybody will be dead. I'm 54 years of age. The most of my life has already been lived. I know that I'm going to die unless Christ comes first. I know that I'm going to die. It's appointed unto man once to die. That's a result of sin that has infected the whole human race. Then there's spiritual death. What is spiritual death? Well, spiritual death is where you are alive in a sense, but you're also dead. And that's why you find movie stars who reach the top, the sex symbols like Marilyn Monroe. Many of them commit suicide. Many of them are unhappy. Why? Because they thought that if they had power and fame and money, they'd be happy, but they're not happy. Why? Because spiritually, your soul made in the image of God is separated from God, and your soul keeps crying out for God. And you say, well, if I make a little more money, maybe my soul will be happy. Or if I get a little more power, or if I have a little more influence, I'll be happy. But the trouble is you're not happy. You see, you want more. And you don't get that certain something that you're always looking for. It's always elusive. It's always out there in the future somewhere. Why? Because your soul is searching for God. And your soul made in the image of God says, I want God. And St. Augustine said, it's restless till it finds God. And until you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and receive him into your heart, You'll always be questing and looking and trying to find, but you won't be able to find. Then there's a third death, and that's called eternal death. That's what Jesus called hell. He used the word lost, perish, condemn, hell, punishment. Whatever it is, it is separation from God 
because of our sins. And the Bible indicates that Jesus believed that there was a future world, there was a future heaven, and a future hell. Now, in the midst of all that, God says, I love man so much, I want to save him. So what did God do? God devised a magnificent plan to redeem you, to save you. He decided to come to earth and to become a man. And that's who Jesus Christ was. Jesus Christ did not have a human father. He was born of the Virgin Mary. Mary couldn't have been more than about 16 or 17 years of age. And she became pregnant, not by a man, but by the Holy Spirit. And she gave birth to a baby. And that baby grew up and he began to teach. And what a person he was. He was only able to teach and heal and feed people for three years. And they crucified him. The Romans took him outside the city walls of Jerusalem. They beat him until his back bled. They put a crown of thorns on his brow and his face bled. They pulled his beard out. They put spikes in his hands. And while they were doing that, 72,000 angels pulled their swords ready to come and sweep this planet into hell. And Jesus said, no, I love them too much. I will bear the hell. I will bear the judgment on the cross for their sins and jesus christ hung there between heaven and earth and in some mysterious way that i do not understand god took your sin and your sin and your sin and my sin and laid them on christ and in that dreadful moment we get a glimpse of what was happening because our lord exclaimed my god my god why hast thou forsaken me and in that terrible, agonizing moment, he was bearing your sins and my sin. He took the death and the hell and the judgment and the sin that I deserved, he took on that cross. The Bible says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Isaiah the prophet had prophesied, the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Paul said, you have made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He was made sin. Jesus Christ became guilty of adultery, of murder, of robbery, of hate, of prejudice. On that cross, he took our sins. He who had never known a sin took our sins and became sin. He became sin for us. And they took his body away and laid him in a grave. But he didn't stay there. The Bible says, on the third day, he arose again. And Jesus Christ at this moment is alive. Right now, he's a living savior. And when they went out to see his body, the angel said, he is not here, for he is risen. And the greatest words that were ever given in the language of men was, he is not here, he is risen. Jesus is alive right now. And he's ready to come into your heart and receive you and receive you into himself so that he will abide in you and you will abide in him if you put your faith and your trust and your confidence in him. Now, that's not the end of the story because God has another plan. God's plan is to send Jesus Christ back to this earth again. When is it going to take place? We don't know. But I believe that there are signs in the scriptures that would indicate that his coming is relatively soon. It may be tomorrow. It may be a thousand years from now. We do not know. But we know that the Bible is filled with passages that indicate that he's coming back. And we are going to have utopia. We are going to have world peace. The lion and the lamb will lie down together. Justice will sweep the earth. And there's coming a day when the dream that Martin Luther King gave in Washington will come true. When all prejudice will be gone and men will have love for each other. But till that time, we're called upon to do the best we can dealing with fallen human nature. 
We can patch up problems here and patch up problems there and patch up problems everywhere. And we spend all of our time patching up problems. And now we have atomic bombs in our hands ready to throw at each other. But Jesus is coming back. And the next time he comes, it will be as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. The Bible says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. I'm looking forward to hearing that shout. I get tired sometimes and I get weary. And I sometimes say, Lord, I wish you were today. Sometimes the pressures are too great and sometimes the burdens of life are too great. And I find myself praying in the middle of the night, Lord, let it be at sunrise tomorrow. I'm ready to go. I want to go. I'm looking forward to heaven. And I'm living in hope and anticipation of that glorious tomorrow in which there'll be no sunset and no darkness. And the streets will be paved with gold. And the fruit trees will bear 12 crops a year. And everybody will have plenty to eat and there'll be no poverty in the world. What a wonderful time that's going to be. But now at this moment in this stadium and on this radio, God the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. The gospel is never preached without the working and the operation of the Holy Spirit. You see, there's a little voice that's been speaking to you while I'm speaking. That's the voice of the Spirit of God. And God has been convicting you of your sin, and God has been convicting you of your need of Jesus Christ. Oh, I know that the majority of you may be members of the church. When I came to Christ many years ago, I was a member of the church. I was the president of the Young People's Society in my church. Everybody thought I was a wonderful Christian. But deep in my heart, I did not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, God loves you. He's given his son. What do you have to do? You have to do something. What is it? First, you have to repent of your sins. Jesus said, repent ye. The apostle Paul said, God now commanded all men everywhere to repent. God commands you to repent. Have you ever repented of your sins? Do you remember the moment when you repented? You say, well, Billy, what do you really mean by repent? Well, first of all, repentance carries with it the idea that you say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. Have you ever said that to God? I'm sorry, and you really meant it? And then it means that you have to change. You have to turn around. You have to change and quit doing your sins. Change your way of living. Old things pass away, and everything becomes new. That's repentance. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to turn from my sin. Have you ever repented? Jesus said, except you repent, you will perish. And then secondly, by faith, you must receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. That can all be done with repentance. Repentance and faith go hand in hand. You may not understand it all intellectually. You don't have to. You come by simple childlike faith. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. The Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, that doesn't mean you do away with your intellect or commit intellectual suicide. Oh, no, there's a logic to the gospel. But your mind has been affected by sin so that you can no longer really receive spiritual things. So you come by faith and receive him. And then the third thing, you must openly confess him as your Lord and Savior and Master. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father, which is in heaven. Now, that's why I ask people to come forward in these crusades. I ask you to openly confess Christ. All over the world, throughout Japan, throughout America, in the great stadiums of Great Britain, and all over Europe, I've seen thousands of people do what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, wherever you are, and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I know that I'm a sinner. I receive Christ into my heart. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. I want a new life in Jesus Christ. You say, Billy, that's a hard thing for me to do, to get up and come in front of everybody. I know. But Jesus hung on that cross in front of a shouting crowd that was spitting at him and laughing at him and mocking him. He died publicly. And not a single place in the New Testament do you find that Jesus ever called anybody privately. It's always publicly that he called them.
And there's a reason for that. A psychological reason, a spiritual reason, a scriptural reason. You say, but how would I ever get through this crowd? I know it's going to be difficult, so I'm going to ask the crowd to help us. I'm going to ask you not to move where you are. Just stay where you are, quiet, reverent, with bowed heads. And I'm going to ask men and women and young people to get up and come and stand in front of the platform and back of the platform here and all around. Just stand here. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some verses of scripture and some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. And if you're with friends or relatives or in a coach, they'll wait on you. You say, well, why is that important? When I got married, I stood in front of witnesses and said, I will. Coming to Christ is in something the same way. You're making a covenant with God to receive Christ into your heart and to receive God's love and forgiveness.